Hey everybody, Dragnix here, and welcome back to The Hunt. I know it's been a while, and I apologize for those fans of the series. After taking a look at The Hunt, and where its strengths and weaknesses were, I went back to the drawing board with it. I wanted to make sure that it came back in a form that I was happy with, so hopefully it was worth the wait for you. So, what are the changes to the format, you may ask? What does the new Hunt look like? The Hunt is now changed to a monthly format. While I like covering a variety of indie games on a daily basis over at my YouTube channel, as well as Tac Raptors, I use that to create a summary format for you all in The Hunt. But in that, there were a lot of mid-level games, and even though they had something to offer, there was a lot of games that didn't stand out compared to some of the games that it was going against. And it was a lot of information for each viewer to take on each week. But The Hunt's purpose has always been to highlight games that may have not gotten the coverage they so deserve. And that won't change. AAA games are not the focus of the hunt, because they get the coverage. Those games that I feel haven't gotten the coverage that they need, that's what this is for. Because the hunt is to find those games that deserve it. Because there's a variety of great prey out there in terms of video games. From the sturdy Triceratops that delivers a constant and solid gameplay experience, to the Pterodactyl who takes flight with new gameplay mechanics that innovates in its genre. Each of the targeted prey will provide something different in terms of what the game has to offer, and hopefully, you'll find a game or two to pick up. Because I play a lot of games every month, and some of them are fantastic and deserve more sales than what they usually get. So without further ado, let's go and hunt. The prey of the pterodactyl deals with the fact that it can fly which means it has wings that can take gaming to new places, or take things that might have gotten stale and make it fresh again. In other words, the pterodactyl is all about some type of innovation. The shoot 'em up genre does have a lot of consistency in it, and while the genre does have a lot of positives and variations that come from that, I haven't run into a situation like I first saw with Horizon Shift. Horizon Shift's gimmick comes from the horizon itself, which is the middle line of the screen in which your ship moves on. Your ship can move on both sides of the horizon in question, attacking your typical waved-based enemies. But while that's not horribly special in of itself, the horizon adds a level of complexity to battle. In terms of managing both sides of the horizon, what the innovation here is is what it adds in terms of enemies attacking the horizon. You see, enemies can blow up, attach themselves, or even completely destroy your horizon depending on what type of enemies they are. Blue outlined enemies will destroy parts of your horizon. Red enemies will get to your horizon and then will move along the horizon attempting to knock into you. Keep in mind though, you have a double jump here. Yellow enemies will do little until they start glowing red, which means they'll completely annihilate your horizon, killing you. Green enemies, well, they just fire projectiles. What this adds is a defense-like mechanic similar to the old Missile Command games, as the gamer must realize sometimes it's better to let an enemy hit the horizon or attach itself to it rather than possibly risking your ship. Enemy combinations in particular are done well here, as it makes you make quick decisions about who to go after and who not to, and sometimes it's not so obvious and can make you pay for making the wrong decision. The platforming elements added in terms of dodging help vary up gameplay, and while the game may have elements that could be strengthened in terms of one or two more power-ups, there are some reasonable ones here, or a random variation of enemies at times, as they come in pre-done waves, the game still has a surprising amount of variety and gameplay for the low, low cost of $5. I was actually really surprised when I heard the amount mentioned, because for that, you get a game that gives you a reasonable bang for buck and replayability, as well as reasonable score chasing. You also get boss fights, but I will say they're probably the weaker sections of the game, as they don't play well in terms of the mechanics overall in my opinion, but follow more standard to what I'd expect out of the genre. And most of the time I died to them was rapid stupidity on my part more than anything else. Let it be known that I, Dragnix, am not a god at games and can make a lot of stupid mistakes. You do get a bonus breakout game after you defeat a boss that I feel can be tweaked a little bit in terms of the speed element of it to make it a tiny bit faster, but it's a nice change of pace after a boss fight. Again, the strongest element of combat comes in the waves format, but it's also nice to change things up. 
You also have a bit of customization options as well in terms of which music you can play, what the visual style you want to play with, and what mode you want to play on. Some modes are straightforward and are slow and progressive, while others are deadly in high increases of speed and a lack of power-ups. While I'm not a fan of some of the visual elements that you can turn on, that's the thing. It's an option to add, and you don't have to use it. You're getting a solid, if not great game for 5 bucks here, and honestly, with several overpriced AAA titles and broken titles, it feels refreshing to see a game like this come out and be well designed and focused on gameplay. I'll be looking more from Flump Studios in the future. The Raptor signifies a fast and exciting mix of gameplay and good game design, like a raptor pack hunting down its prey. And in particular to the site's namesake, this week's raptor choice fits the theme rather well in Jump Jet Rex and his jet-powered boots. While it was highlighted on the first ever hunt segment, it came out of early access in the month of May, which gives us all the more reason to take a look at the game in its full form. The basic story is your home planet is about to blow up, and you, Jump Jet Rex, need to stop it. Your job is to race to the comet, to plant a bomb on it, to cause it to explode before it hits your planet. You do that by speeding through levels and completing objectives, usually going through rings or just racing through to the exit. Each level has three possible stars that you can get, one for completing the level, one for getting through the level without losing a life, and one for breaking the target time. You'll need specific amount of stars in order to get further and further toward your end goal, with an occasional boss battle thrown in the mix to liven things up. The game in terms of its speedrunning mechanics works rather well, and honestly, the lack of traditional platforming in terms of this speedrunner helps it feel a bit unique. Rex does have a couple of tricks up his, I guess, claws in terms of getting around the environment. He can dash forward, he can propel himself upward like a rocket, and he can do what is probably the cutest butt slam on a dinosaur ever. Of course, he has an infinite jump, and you have enough control to move yourself around the environment as fast as you can while avoiding obstacles, hazards, and enemies that the game throws at you. When the game is on point, it's thrilling, as you try to eke out those precious seconds off the clock to hit leaderboards or get those stars. It helps that there's a great ghost system here to help you out, to show you exactly how the last run or someone else's run went. And what's great is that at times, sometimes you have to really think about how to shave time off the clock in unconventional ways. Here's a hint, attempting to go for all three stars in one run is probably a bad idea. There's a variety in levels here too, from more open levels that challenge your movement and your ability to pathfind, to smaller levels that test your twitch reflexes and reaction time. There is one thing I have to say though regarding early access that I think hurt the game. The level progression can be all over the place, as some of the early levels are sprinkled throughout the courses, and you can go from what was a rather easy level to a ridiculously difficult one, back to an easy one again. And the final levels? Yeah, they're hard. You'll die a lot. The visuals range all over the place, but for the most part, they do the job, with occasional exceptions to the rule. There's ice worlds here, forest worlds, a bunch of worlds for you to explore, and in the end, just enjoy. What I did enjoy more is the customization of Rex himself, as you can make him different colors, give him accessories, and even early access people got a Gaben head. Now you can be your favorite Valve employee running through trying to escape people asking about Half-Life 3. Speedrunners are one of those genres that I think people will either really enjoy or won't be a fan of, with not a lot of people seemingly in the middle. But for speedrunners, Jump Jet Rex definitely does the job for bringing a nice experience that can keep you entertained and has a certain charm to it that I can't really put into words. Also, the main character is a dinosaur. It automatically wins because of that. So crude. The sort who prefers to be called an adventurer. I'm mere the Triceratops is known as a sturdy creature with its strong body structure as well as the usefulness of its triple horns. And what it brings to the table is a game that's solid and consistently strong with its experience throughout. And while it may be elements that we've seen before in games or has nostalgic elements to it, it doesn't matter as the game itself is a great game nonetheless. 
Techno Babylon brings us a modern day version of the old point and click LucasArts games, not only in its visual art style, but in its strong emphasis on narrative and its quirky puzzle logic. It brought me back to the days of my youth, and yet was updated for the modern times with modern themes of governmental control, the internet, and the reliance of technology. The story follows three main characters. There's Charlie Regis, a member of the Cell Police Force, who has a checkered past as a researcher. His partner, Max Lau, who serves as the foil to Charlie, and her personality is a little bit more data-minded and more of a what-if character. And Lotha Sesame, a jobless agoraphobe who lives out her time in the trance, which is basically a VR representation of the internet. The main plot starts off with a serial killer that has been hitting various people who connect to the trance and seemingly getting information out of their heads. But what unravels is a story about an AI named Central that oversees the city but brings up questions regarding human versus computer control, and various strong subplots emerge as you learn about the city of Newton and this future semi-dystopian society. The writing here is strong, as good characterization is throughout the story. In particular, there's a strong back and forth dialogue between characters. The characters, for the most part, feel natural in how they react to a situation, and how their combination of character quirks would go together. In particular, I took a liking to Latha, as her character development and personality worked well for who I am as a person. And as a person who knows someone who's agoraphobic, they did a great job in my eyes of hitting several of the themes that surround the condition, which can be really hard to do. Obviously, that's coming from my own unique perspective, but I feel like no matter what the situation in this game, you'll have a character or two that you'll get attached to, and the game hits some hard themes or some unexpected elements rather well, using a surgeon's touch around complicated issues while still hitting to the core of it. Never offensive, but never afraid to go there either. The puzzle elements of the game are hit and miss, as some serve as a great test of mental fortitude and listening skills, as you put things together to determine how to get to the next portion of the game. In particular, some of the better puzzles of the game are the open-path, multi-part puzzles, such as the plant lab, where you have to collect samples that really test your interaction with other characters and elements in the environment, as well as really listening to key informational elements that give you hints on what you need to do. Those hints don't beat you over the head with the hint, but give you enough of a clue to take a look at it. But on the other hand, others suffer from those old adventure game logic, where a manual would really help you out. But you lose that creative puzzle solving element in the process. Sometimes it's the fact that you missed a contextual item in the room. Other times it's your eyes playing tricks on you. But for the most part, the puzzles seem reasonable and a good challenge of your deductive reasoning powers, as it helps carry the game through its beautiful pixel environments and variety of locations and characters. Overall, for fans of point-and-click adventure games with strong narratives, and in particular, those who loved the old LucasArts games, Techno Babylon will deliver on several fronts, and will be a great story to follow along with. The Brontosaurus is one of the first dinosaurs that come to mind in terms of fiction, having such memorable scenes in The Land Before Time and Jurassic Park. And like those classic movies, the Brontosaurus represents a game that brings out elements of storytelling and keeps you hooked with those elements. There is a couple of games that could have filled this position this month easily, such as Techno Babylon. But I'm going to go with Why Am I Dead at Sea as my Brontosaurus for this month. Based on a popular Flash game, the story of Why Am I Dead at Sea centers around you, who finds him or herself waking up to being, well, a ghost. You communicate with a mysterious young boy, who's basically the boy from The Sixth Sense, to find out that, well, you're sort of dead. But you haven't passed on, and now it's your job to figure out who you were, what happened to you, and what is going on in this mysterious cruise with passengers of all sorts. You do this by possessing people, finding out secrets about them to unlock more people and deeper levels of possession. Each person has their own unique skill or trait, and you've got to use the various combos to find out more about the ship, the crew, and yourself. You can also read people's minds. 
which is usually more hilarious than anything else. Not as useful though. I find that mysteries are probably one of the hardest story types to get right in terms of the video game genre. Having interactive elements while trying to hit key story points can be a hard balance to hit, provide too little information to the player, and it gets boring. But hold their hand too much, and it's just another story. Why Am I Dead at Sea in my eyes hits the balance between those two points. It never forces the story on you, never really goes overboard in terms of elements, but gives you enough to piece things together and really get connected to characters and what they are going through. The characters' variations and various dark secrets and pasts will connect with you on several levels, and the writing here, it's wonderful as it wheels a tale of deception and pulls on the heartstrings. While its logic at times can be a little bit out there in terms of solutions, or not straightforward whatsoever, it's one of those games that really do a great job in hooking in the audience and keeping them. While the visuals aren't the greatest, they do hark back to a time of Earthbound in some ways for me in terms of the characters' faces and movement, and the outside boat location in particular does stand out in terms of some nice artwork. I do like the music, however, and while I do recognize some of the music is free to use, what's done well here is contextual music. Each character has their own music that fits their personality, so when going into a room or possessing them, you start hearing their music to sort of get you into the mood of sorts for that character. Little touches like that, or unlocking more of who you are showing up in elements of your ghost, really does a wonderful job in selling the game's story. If you like mysteries and are a patient player, you'll get your money's worth out of the $10 title, as it's basically an interactive mystery that makes you the detective. And heck, if you're still skeptical, like I said, there's a free Flash game that you can play that's like the story in question, a lot more basic in my mind, that can serve as a demo of sorts. Give it a try, and then consider taking a look at Why Am I Dead at Sea? Yes, those little dinosaurs from the Jurassic Park series are here, and they represent a game that comes out of nowhere to overwhelm you despite possible low expectations or for various other reasons. It's not very often you see a game on Steam that is not only free, but doesn't have some sort of microtransactions in it. It's even rarer that the game is also good, and serves as a great entry for those who've always wanted to try a genre of games. And yet, Jigoku Ketsukan Sense of the Seasons does just that by being a free bullet hell game that has all the hallmarks of the genre, but does its job well to bring fun to the player. Obviously influenced by games such as the Toho series, Jigoku follows a series of anime characters such as a Yaoma cat girl, of course you have to have a cat girl, through a series of levels of various difficulty. The story, while not the strong point of the game, is accompanied by some good anime style drawings and fun character design. And while it may have a couple of tropes that you would expect, once again I point to the cat girl, they still were enjoyable. What's great here is of course the gameplay. The controls give you enough control to get through the various hazards and enemies that come at you. The game does a great job of keeping the variation up with the different enemies and bullet patterns it throws at you and different characters you unlock have different strengths of various types to add to that. I want to really emphasize that. There's a lot of different patterns and combinations that it throws at you, which a couple of them I've never seen before, and that surprised me. Good variation of mini bosses as well as bosses, and I love the fact that health bars take different forms based on the boss in question. While not the most impressively looking game, it does do the job in terms of a game that is of course free and kept me entertained and challenged throughout it. A good amount of smart design decisions in understanding what exactly plays to the strengths of its own game. What also surprised me though was its level of detail in terms of difficulty. A player who's new to the genre will feel challenged yet okay with the easiest difficulty while those who are bullet hell diehards will get a challenge out of its hell mode, and that's rare to do in games like this in my opinion. The different powers and power-ups you can collect changes things up a bit, and the soundtrack surprisingly works well for a free game. In fact, it feels rather well put together. 
While the visuals of enemies sometimes blend in the background, at least the bullets are always neon so you can always see what's coming at you. A game like this could easily be worth 5 or 10 bucks alone, but the fact that it's free? That makes it a no-brainer for those who want to play it, and the only thing that it will cost you is time. And honestly, your time will be well spent with this game. The game rewards forward-looking in terms of the bullet patterns you like to expect from the genre, but will reward those who can think quickly and move quickly to get back to firing at the enemy. It has flaws, but it's a free game that has a lot to offer. Go try it out. All right, so the Velociraptor isn't an actual dinosaur by some people's eyes, but hey, we are tech raptors. We give preferential treatment to all raptor-related creatures. The Velociraptor indicates a game that really makes you think, that makes you challenge preconceived notions about games in several ways, whether it be the terms of an emotional connection or the subject matter a game talks about, to the way that you may interact or play with the game. It makes you wonder exactly what the experience you are going through is. Sim is an interesting look into the world of social anxiety disorder and the representation of that within a platformer. A lot of games try to hit deep themes and take a look at illnesses and problems in a game format, but Sim stands out in the multi-layered ways that it represents the things in its world. The basic concepts of the game involve a mirror world, as you have your regular world that you would normally go through, but the other world being a world that you escape to when things get a little scary or you don't want to interact with the regular world. Each set of levels hits a particular theme in terms of an element of social anxiety, such as wanting to disappear from the world and be left alone. What's really great is the symbolism here, that it's all over the place. It's really up to you to see the connections with it. The idea of a plant devouring you does that represent a fear of someone you have to talk to, overwhelming you with their words and swallowing you whole? What about those eyes that are always watching, seemingly never giving you a moment of privacy? But it's the less obvious symbolism that really makes the game shine. Sometimes there are easier paths if you escape to your other world. But is that truly a good thing? When you could get through the regular path with just careful maneuvering? That's why it's an interesting game. The amount of things that the game made me really think about was astonishing, and this coming from someone who only knows someone who has the disorder. Needless to say, it hit on several levels for me. The haunting melody of the world and the black and white color aesthetic do a great job of painting a depressing and haunting image of the world that you are going through. The platforming is probably more difficult than it needs to be, however. There's elements of puzzle solving like most games in the genre have, but sometimes the preciseness that you need in order to make some of the jumps can be a little bit problematic and lead to frustration. There are a variety of levels here, however, and the game does keep track of how many times you die, which is always nice to know. But in the end, this is a very specialized game. It's an $8 game that doesn't live on its gameplay or platforming skill but more about its unconventional storytelling and symbolism to make you think about things in an overall perspective. If you know somebody affected by social anxiety disorder or want to really take an experience to think about things, you should consider picking the game up. It's a thinker. The T-Rex is the king of the dinosaurs and is the game of the month that I want to highlight. And while it technically came out on April 30th, I'm cheating in this case, because I didn't get a chance to include it in a hunt, and I'm a huge fan of the game in question, because it plays to my nostalgia and has a bunch of great elements behind it. I did consider not putting it in the list due to a certain British YouTube personality covering the game, but with only 13 Metacritic reviews, I honestly want to bring light to the wonderful world that is Chroma Squad, because this Power Ranger themed adventure is definitely the highlight of an overall strong month of releases. The basis of Chroma Squad is that you are a new studio of stunt actors who broke off from their jobs taking second fiddle to the stars of their old studio as you create your own series of Power Ranger shows. The game is divided into two major parts, the combat and the maintenance of the show. The combat involves the typical tactical RPG mechanics with a couple of special twists. The idea here is that you attack your enemies and do specific moves to gain audience and fan power. 
Once you have enough, you can transform into your Power Rangers through a specialized catchphrase that you can customize, along with a variety of other elements of your characters. Each character plays a specific role and has specific skills, such as the support class that can heal teammates, or the lead who can buff his other rangers. The director during each episode will give you a series of challenges that you will need to fulfill to get extra fans and audience, which is important as you need a certain amount to get through a season without being cancelled. But the unique aspect regarding Chroma Squad's combat deals with the teamwork system and acrobatics. Any Power Ranger can use the teamwork option. Those who go to that teammate in terms of movement can be flung farther than they could normally, which means that you can position yourself rather well. In addition, if you attack an enemy and have someone using teamwork around that enemy, you can combine your attacks to do higher amounts of damage than you could normally by yourself. All five rangers can come together to do a finisher, which can finish off a show rather nicely. But don't do it if the enemy can't be knocked out, or you'll actually lose audience. While the tactical RPG mechanics have a couple of hitches with it, such as the enemy AI not always going after a weak character they can knock out, on the hard difficulty, you'll find yourself really given a rather strong challenge, as you will attempt to take down your enemies efficiently and without losing characters, but also attempting to gain that needed fan support. Every so often, you'll have a mech fight that involves a mini game of sorts with your giant mech of power, which changes things up rather nicely. The other major element is the maintenance of your studio and its customization. You have a lot of ways to customize your characters, experience, and studio to give yourself various benefits and play to your specific playstyle. What's nice here is that the upgrades fit the theme of a studio that's starting up to make a season of Power Rangers. Crafting new equipment, for example, is by duct taping cardboard and plastics together to make more powerful equipment with stat boosts. You add equipment to your studio to enhance your performers and weaken enemies. Hiring advertising firms that do specific jobs, such as getting you more fans converted from your audience or give you benefits at the start of combat. Customization of your mech and the equipment parts to it as well. The aforementioned customization of your slogan, your team name, and studio name is also there and customization of characters and their unique attributes. Having selectable characters such as Michonne from Walking Dead, to a robot, to not Wesley Snipes. The game does get awfully close to walking the infringement line. But overall, what Chroma Squad does well is provide a solid, tactical RPG experience, but provides the nostalgia of the old show in terms of its cheesiness and over-the-top writing. It's all about the nostalgia here, and those who didn't watch the show won't get the way it goes about things in terms of presentation. And while some may indicate that it has themes of social justice in it, that's the thing. It's exactly what you would expect to see on the show of the Power Rangers when you were a kid, in terms of the lessons of friendship, diversity, etc. And anyone who was a fan of the old shows should immediately pick up this game, as they'll be in for a treat. I loved every minute I had with Chroma Squad that I played, but read a couple of reviews and watch a couple of videos of course, like always. But for me, it's the highlight of another fun month of games. Okay, again, technically I'm cheating, but damn, I wanted to highlight this game. And those are the top prey for the month of May. Now, I'll show off little short tidbits at the end of each hunt of games that didn't quite make the list, but they were games that I looked at in the month of May that I still think were reasonable in some way. And I'll also include some notes on what made them stand out in the end. One thing that I would like to ask everyone who's still around watching the video is to give feedback on the new format and what you like, dislike, or just general thoughts on it. Again, this is me playing with the formula in an attempt to not only get better information to you, the viewer, and expose games that really truly deserve it, but obviously to make a product that people would want to look at at a monthly basis. The best way to do that, in my opinion, is direct feedback from the viewer, so I'd love to hear exactly what everyone thinks. Don't pull any punches either, because harsh criticism sometimes is the best formula for making something better, to a certain extent, of course. Obviously this video took a bit of time and a lot of effort, but I want to make it easier for people to find games that look interesting to them and ultimately make this a regular segment on the YouTube side of things. In addition, I'm also technically the YouTube editor for Tech Raptor now, and so I want to hear from everyone what they'd like to see more of on the channel. 
Now, like I said, I still do my own YouTube channel thing, but I want to hear what people are looking for from Tech Raptor in terms of video content. Do you want more opinion pieces, more scouting party first impressions? Leave all your comments below, and I'm definitely going to take a look at them, that's for sure. I am experimenting with a couple of things, but it is nice to get direct feedback on this kind of stuff. Once again, I thank everyone for watching. And if you liked the video, you know, share it with a friend or two that you think would get some use out of the video in terms of information. I'll see you next month with another hunt. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you're looking for more content, go check out that game design video on Crypt of the Necrodancer that I did. You could always subscribe to the Tech Raptor channel, and you can always go take a look at my channel on the side. This is Dragnix signing out, and I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.